the new economy and its discontents. This week, I'll talk with Palak Shah about the Good Work Code. It's an attempt to bring workers' rights to Silicon Valley. And later, Wealth of Networks guru Yokai Benkler asks why the people who create the content on Facebook, you and me, don't get to own it. All that and a commentary from me on the mad borrowing of Apple. Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Through companies like Uber and Etsy, Silicon Valley has been shaping the wages and working conditions for all sorts of low-wage workers. Now, low-wage workers are attempting to make some rules for Silicon Valley. Palak Shah is Social Innovations Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. In addition to helping create the Good Work Code, she's worked in state government for Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick and in, for the grassroots for the Los Angeles Bus Riders Union, Generation 5, and Oakland Rising in the Bay Area. I'm very glad to welcome Palak Shah to the show. Hi, Palak. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about this Good Work Code. A, why do we need one and who's it for? Well, the Good Work Code is a very simple framework of eight values that can guide the creation of good work in the online economy. It's a North Star, a framework of eight principles like safety or transparency or input and inclusion that can guide uh, these new models as they emerge out of Silicon Valley on how the uh, online economy can be a good place to work. Now, for our what's the problem? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the drawbacks of Uber for, organi for, for situations or workplaces or, or industries that have already been organized, taxi workers and so on. Um, but for a lot of the gig workers in Silicon Valley, we're looking at people who might work alone in their home, might be independent and want to be that way. Yeah, no, and I think that that's kind of the promise of the Silicon Valley and the kind of new models that are emerging, right? But at the same time, we want to balance how, do, how does work create stability for workers as well, and that's a core principle of the Good Work Code. I think a lot of um, what we realized at the National Domestic Workers Alliance was that um, our workers, right, nannies, house cleaners, um, caregivers, have been working in kind of informal markets um, and without the kind of traditional protections that most of us take for granted. Mm -hmm. And what we noticed was that as the conversation nationally around the plight of gig workers um, started to grow, we realized there are a lot of similarities to between what gig workers were facing and what domestic workers mm. have been facing for 70 years. And those are things like working without contracts, uh, you know, working without access to benefits or health care, inconsistent hours, a whole host of issues that then contribute to the ability for a domestic worker or any gig worker to kind of make their way in this economy. Tell us a story a, a bit or, or lay it out for us a little bit what it's like to do some of those jobs because there may be people watching that say, well, that sounds kind of fun to work for work for Etsy or, or, or work for another online firm. Yeah, and I think there are, you know, I think these models are emerging and there's a lot of advantages to uh, the flexibility that some of the models are providing, and yet there's a lot of risk. Um, there's a lot of business model decisions that are pushing risk down onto workers, and there are a lot of um, changes in the way that we work, right? In, in the current economy or the offline economy, you go to work and you know who your boss is and it's kind of easy to figure that out. In the age of on-demand and an app-based economy, who actually is your boss and how do you raise the concerns that you have at work? And how do you share your concerns with other workers who you never even meet? Now, and that of isolation of gig workers is actually very structurally similar to the isolation that domestic workers have faced for a long time. And so the Good Work Code, the offering of this eight principle framework on how to make work good is, is essentially um, a, a very simple uh, set of guidelines mm. Uh, so tell us, can you, can you do, do the eight or, or, or give us an example of a four of them or something? Of course. So <laughs> the first value that's in the Good Work Code is around safety, right? And the real principle behind it is that everyone deserves to be safe at work. One of the things that we started to learn as, we, uh, as some of domestic workers started to engage in these online models is that um, people would often go into situations, right? Domestic workers worked behind closed doors and in other people's homes. And when they were in those situations, because of the particularities of rating systems, right? I mean, if you've taken an Uber or Lyft, you rate your driver. Um, well, there's an interaction between the ratings and the ability, the uh, ability of the workers to get right. access to more work or, or their wages. And so what we started to learn was that there may be unintended consequences of rating systems in keeping people in unsafe situations. And so safety is one example of 
of a good work code principle. But right, transparency so is safety, another. Safety, transparency. Transparency is another. This kind of balancing of, of flexibility and stability, right? So that people appreciate the flexibility of schedules, but then how do you actually have a stable enough schedule to be able to predictably earn enough income? So transparency around, will I have a job next week or even tomorrow? And if so, at what time? Well, it, and also transparency around the way that work shifts when it's mediated through an app, when work is distributed through code or through text messages on your phone. So how does the algorithm actually work? What keeps you on a platform? What mm. might get you more work? What might get you kicked off a platform? Why are you presenting this good work code right now? Well, I think what's happening right now is there's a real fundamental shift that's happening in the future of work. Um, and. I believe that there's a real opportunity to harness the power of new models that are emerging while they're still early in their development and shape the DNA of these models. Um, and the Good Work Code is the kind of framework, right, the set of guidelines that can get these models um, to uh, not just work for the customers and the investors, which is where the most of the focus has been, but for the workers as so well. So I can see the advantage for all of us having a sense of what this code's elements might be. And I encourage people to go and check it out on our website, see all eight points. That's good for us as workers, uh, as well as for employers. But how do you hold anyone accountable um, when the old mechanisms of how you do that through industrial action, strikes, protest, don't really work in the online economy. Well, I think it remains to be seen what will work and what doesn't work. Um, I think, you know, the economy is shifting and so the labor movement and the response of the worker rights movements are going to shift as well. I do think that it is, you know, we're at a point right now where um, the theory of the good work code, right, is to say, can we agree on a shared vision mm -hmm. of where the online economy should be we, going. We, the workers, the employer, That's the right. employers, and the clients. That's right. Customers. And there's both a moral and ethical case for this, of course, right? We represent some of the most vulnerable workers um, in this country. Um, but at the same time, there's a business case for this. These models actually cannot succeed without a reliable, quality um, workforce that can deliver a good service. And so there is a kind of, uh, that presents, I think, an opportunity for the labor movement to really shape the emergence of an industry before it actually gets mm. as big, where it becomes more difficult to shape. Well, you talked about size and coming to scale, and we often talk with small business owners about their desire to have their model come to scale. Uh, but there's also the people who say, yeah, but this system that we have right now, this whole econ economic system is problematic. Uh, wealth tends to, to, to sort of circulate to the top and stick there. Um, things do get super big and hard to, to um, demand transparency or accountability from. Um, is there in what you're doing any possibility of changing our economy? Or, or do you believe as a whole, or do you believe that you can kind of protect us from the worst of it, correct the flaws um, as it is? Well, I think the similarities that we see is that in the same way that domestic work has been the wild west of parts of the economy, there is a kind of wild west nature right now to the emergence of these yeah. online models and the on-demand economy. And that we have an opportunity, it's up to us to shape it. I think the Good Work Code is one strategy that we're advancing to kind of set forth a positive vision and to surface those companies that are actually one, agree with the values mm -hmm. of the Good Work Code and form essentially a center of gravity in Silicon Valley that's saying, no, actually it's possible um, to treat your workers well and it's actually core to the business. And so, we've seen a lot of um, models and companies make recent announcements over the last quarter or so um, articulating that point of view. At the same time, I think the labor movement is going to need to pursue a number of different strategies. Mm -hmm. This is one. Organizing workers is another. There's obviously going to have to be a policy and regulation intervention. But so much is new in this part of the economy, at least as it relates to the technology components of it, that there's some things that will just take some time for us to figure out. On the other hand, there are some things that are exactly the same as they were before, and there's a um, th we know what those issues are, right? It's the same issues that low-wage workers have been facing for, for decades. In all of this discussion, in your view, um, what difference does, does race and, or do race and gender make? Well, I think it's a complicated question, and I don't think we know enough about all of the various unattended and intended consequences of the new models that are emerging. 
What we do know, at least from the point of view of our workers, is that um, a large number of our workers are immigrant women or people who are monolingual Spanish speakers, and that if we want to build an inclusive economy, which I do think there is a shared vision right now around, if we want to build an inclusive economy, there are subtle tweaks to operations, right, that are kind of outlined in the Good Work Code that will take us one step further to building an economy that's inclusive of people who don't speak English or people who um, may not have as much access to job opportunities. Palak, thank you so much for joining us. Is there a way that people can get more information about the Good Work Code and maybe bring it to the attention of the people they work with or for? Yeah, so there's a website. Our website is www.goodworkcode.org. And on that website, you can see the 12 companies who've already signed on and committed to the principles of the Good Work Code and um, what they're planning on doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. You can get more information about the Good Work Code and more at our website. Recently, Laura Flanders' show guest host Pamela Brown had a chance to speak to author and Harvard Law professor Yochai Benkler about Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, and profit. Here's that interview. Will the users of Facebook ever own Facebook? My name is Pam Brown, and I'm sitting in today for Laura Flanders. Yohai Benkler, author of The Wealth of Networks, How Social Production Transforms Markets and Freedom, Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School, and faculty co-director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, is here today to talk about the history of peer production on the internet and about the possibility of massively popular and user-owned online platforms. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm thrilled to be here. So let's start with something very basic. What is peer production? Peer production is the way in which people work together to produce Wikipedia. It's the way in which people work together to produce the free software that most of the services on the internet run, the basic web servers, the basic script. It basically means that sometimes 10, sometimes 10,000 people come together and work on producing something without having anyone own it, without having anyone direct anyone else in terms of what to do just through social collaboration. And so doesn't that, all, doesn't that happen very regularly in our society as it stands? What's different about what we've seen since the advent of the internet with, with these kinds of peer production? So we've always had social production. People have been telling each other stories and sharing the news, but that didn't compete with the New York Times. People have been singing together, but that didn't compete with the industries. People have been helping each other move, but that didn't compete with the uh, moving industry. What happened in mm -hmm. the networked economy was that um, for the first time really since the Industrial Revolution, the most important resources in society were widely distributed in the population. Computers, sensors, storage, but also inside creativity, availability, so people were doing things they'd always done socially together in ways that were important for them socially, but peripheral to the economy of the 20th century. And now it moved from the periphery of the economy to the center of the economy. This was the big transition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so as it's moved from the periphery to the center, have, ha, does that lead us to think that people may have more meaningful work, that wealth in our economy might be spread <coughs> more equitably? It seems, on the other hand, that that has not been the case. So this is the really critical question. What peer production, what work in the commons of the internet has taught us is that it is possible, if we organize our work correctly, to do things differently, to do things in a much more democratic and collaborative way. But at no point was it reasonable to think that the internet would force it to happen this way. What happened was that in the 20th century, we had a small number of companies controlling a lot of production. And in the early 21st century, it looked like things were opening up. It looked like cooperation was replacing. But instead, what we've actually seen is a small number of companies coming into this widely shared internet commons and layering over some platforms that are able to extract that value for a small number of shareholders. 
That's the big challenge. Is something like that Facebook, for example, or Uber, or Airbnb? Facebook is the perfect early example. Google is also a perfect <laughs> early example. I think Uber and Airbnb are really important to talk about, but they're even a newer generation. Mm. If you look at the first generation, at Facebook, for example, what you have is people are producing the value. They share their social relations. They share their conversations. People are producing the value. But the one company that has actually provided the platform has collected the most important value, as it were, which is the attention and the data, and converted it into a network that now actually allows them to manipulate the users in order to sell them to advertisers. Here, advertising revenue has really been the core source of um, uh, problems or, or risk. Because if all of these billions of users were paying even a very small amount, um, the company could afford essentially not to sell their data, not to control their data. If the users all owned it and paid a membership fee of a dollar a month, you'd have an enormously productive uh, uh, company, or obviously different in different countries. But instead, what you have is that it's actually the commons, the fact that everybody shares their data creates a new, um, uh, a new place for some companies to mine. And just as with the commons of the air and the pollution mm -hmm. of the 19th and 20th century, where a small number of companies use the commons in ways that increase their wealth, but at the expense of shared culture, data is in some sense today's pollution. Mm -hmm. It takes the commons of social relations, extracts value from it, but captures and eliminates privacy and creates a surveillance society that is completely new to us. Is, is my posting on Facebook a form of labor in that context? I don't think that it's a form of labor. It's a form of being. It's a form of social relations. The problem here, unlike with Uber or TaskRabbit, the problem here is not extracting the value of your labor, because I think what you do on Facebook is much more akin to what you did in leisure. It's the fact that you're producing something that has value, and in the process of giving you the ability to do it, the company is capturing the value in a way that doesn't respect what you brought into it, which is your social relations, your sense of identity and privacy, and instead commodifies everything. It's more of an extraction and mining industry than it mm -hmm. is a, a labor extraction company. That makes it very different from some of the companies that have been called sharing economy, which are really much more on-demand uh, economy, like Uber. So I guess what I want to think about is the possibility that um, peer production of this kind could be something that's positive, economically, socially, help with inequality, um, or help diminish inequality. How can that actually happen now? One of the most exciting developments in the past year or year and a half has been the increasing call in a variety of uh, sectors for, cooperative, for cooperativism. Uh, the increasing call to build systems that would replicate some of the conveniences uh, and efficiencies of the on-demand economy, but using platforms where users share the ownership and the governance and the management of the platform rather than simply uh, leaving them to investor-owned firms. Um, cooperatives have a very long tradition. They've been around for over 100 years. Um, they work in some sectors and in some industries, but not in others. Where they have worked, They've generally provided more stable income, though not necessarily higher, mm. uh, less uh, susceptibility to volatility. In other words, people's income was more stable. After the recession in many worker co-ops, instead of people being laid off, everybody took a bit of a pay cut and <laughs> waited until things got better. So even if workers weren't getting better salaries, there was more stability. The other thing is there's a very strong ethical commitment to people participating, people participating in the governments, controlling their everyday work. So the critically exciting new direction is to take some of these basic economies that have worked for these investor-owned startups, 
which actually mean that it's relatively inexpensive to build such a platform and translate what we learned from peer production in Wikipedia um, and free software into the fact that people can organize themselves on this shared platform. If we can build that, what we've learned historically is that cooperatives emerge and can compete in markets, but they don't dominate a market. So you need to want to do it, you need to build it, and if you build it, it can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. It won't necessarily knock the competition out of the market, but it also won't die. But if you build it, then you have a real opportunity for all of those peoples, whether they're TaskRabbit, whether they're Instacart, whether they're Uber, to be their own managers, to govern themselves, and to govern themselves in such a way that assures a security of income that shares the risk instead of simply extracting the value for the few and externalizing all of the risk onto the actual workers and providers. So this will be the last question. <coughs> We're almost out of time. Um, in that case, for, for you, does this look like something other than capitalism? Or are cooperatives just going to become incorporated into basically a capitalist economy? Or is there a possibility that they would move us into a different form of social relation? I think cooperatives provide a serious alternative to capitalism. If by capitalism we mean the basic idea that the means of production or organization production are owned by people who own the capital, and these people who own the capital are fundamentally different of people who provide the labor and people who use and consume the goods. Instead, if you have a model where control over the resources, negotiation and governance of how production happens, how distribution happens, what is responsible consumption, is negotiated within a population of people, some of whom are providers, some of whom are users, many of whom are both, that's capitalism in the very minimal sense of it's a market economy. It's not a state-ordered economy. But it is a fundamentally different relation. It's a relation where production is social, where meaningful work and a decent living are the basic commitment more than shareholder value, which is not an independent value. And in this regard, it is a fundamental form of market society, certainly than the capitalism we have seen in, uh, over the last 40 years since the late 70s and 1980, which has been a much more extractive, much more unequal, and much more inhumane form of capitalism than uh, we are uh, able to uh, build together. Thank you so much for joining us today, Yohai Benkler. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. You can find links to Yokai Benkler's books at our website. While we're talking about high tech, something strange and surprising happened this winter. The Apple Corporation went out and borrowed six and a half billion dollars. That's right, the same Apple Corporation that had just finished announcing the largest quarterly profits of any company ever on the planet. The same Apple Corporation that famously has a mountain of cash on hand, at last count some $170 billion. Why would Apple take the trouble of issuing bonds to raise the money they need to pay their stockholders? Couldn't they dip into some of that cash? Well, some of the answer is that Apple's money is tied up in treasury bills, which don't pay out for a while. But a far bigger part of the explanation is overseas. The profits that Apple makes outside the United States tend to stay there, where corporate tax rates are lower even than they are in the U.S. Some accounts report a rate around 2% on some of their business. To get that money to pay those stockholders, Apple would have to repatriate that money or bring it back into the U.S., at which point the American tax system could conceivably, although it probably wouldn't, slap them with a 35% corporate income tax bill. That's one hell of a reason not to bring those profits back. Instead, Apple goes out and borrows money in the U.S., and U.S. bond buyers are happy to buy because they know all about that cash pile. It's one heck of a way to run an economy. To tell me what you think, you can write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.